piece to uh, our our practice. Um, the um, our next speaker, and I'm really honored to have Michael on. Uh, Michael Stoich, um, Michael, I pronounced that correct? Stoich. Um, Michael is um, somebody that I've known for quite a long time. He is a, a partner and co-chair at of the Mergers and Acquisitions Group at uh, JMBM uh, Law Firm, which is Jeffrey Mangles, Butler, and Mitchell. JMBM is a California-based um, uh, kind of a um, special, uh, specialty firm. If all of you, please put your mute mics on mute, if you would, please. Um, and uh, JMBM has a big practice and trust the state, uh, M&A, real estate, uh, kind of a whole host of um, a whole host of um, services that their firm does, and they have offices throughout the um, uh, throughout the, um, the state and affiliates throughout the country. And Michael is, as I said, he's the co-chair of the mergers and acquisitions practice and. I thought he'd be a terrific uh, speaker uh, and expert on uh, this presentation today that I would say for all of you has garnered a lot of, um, uh, have garnered a lot of um, interest. Um, and uh, I wanna thank all of you for, for being on the, uh, on the presentation today. So as I said, if you have questions, uh, now that we're, everybody seems to be coming in, uh, please ask your questions during the chat, in the chat room, and I'll try to address them as we go along. So to get into the, the topic today is, how do you value and how do you sell a fiduciary practice? And um, as, as a company, I, I just wanna say, we are not business brokers in what Braun International and Premier Estates does, but through the course of the years, through valuation, we've been asked by a number of fiduciaries to help at least think about strategy and valuation of their practice. And through my business background dealing with, um, you know, company assets, I guess I've um, been able to provide some, I hope, valuable advice and. Um, this uh, presentation today, I, I have learned uh, through just through the interest of everyone um, signing up how how uh, important this is for the future of your individual practice business, and you know what do you do when you decide you want to um, to move on to the next chapter of your life, whatever that is. So I'm going to start with Jim, um, and again, Jim is. Uh, our, one of our valuation experts and also a tax uh, uh, CPA, so a tax specialist. So Jim, in your um, expertise, what is, what is your process when you would look at valuing a professional services company, such as a, a private independent fiduciary? Well, well, how do you want to start with that? Okay, well, from my, from my viewpoint, um, every valuation engagement is sort of the same thing. You have three approaches that you always consider. You don't always use all three, but you should at least consider them. Uh, the first approach is an asset approach that almost never applies to a personal service company like a professional fiduciary or CPA such as myself. Uh, the second approach is a market approach. Um, just like real estate, there are databases out there that have sales of um, companies within the space of, say, a, pro, a professional fiduciary, CPA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the last approach is an income approach. Um, so we consider all three, but for a professional fiduciary, I think it's really just the last two, market approach and an income approach. Um, so I did look at uh, three different databases to try to find comps for a market approach for professional fiduciaries. I found only one data point. Um, and one data point is not sufficient uh, to give you any statistical validity uh, whatsoever. You need probably at least six. So a lot of times when that happens, we look for uh, what I'm gonna say is a proxy, uh, uh, a different professional, but that has a lot of the same characteristics that a, uh, professional fiduciary might. 
In this case, I looked at uh, business management companies. They, they do a lot of similar sorts of things um, that uh, professional fiduciaries do. By looking at a proxy group like this, I was able to get uh, sufficient data points uh, to figure out you know, what, what, what kind of multiples might work. Um, and for professional fiduciaries, the top two multiples are price to revenue and price to SDE. SDE is referred to as seller's discretionary earnings. They both have very good um, correlations as far as their market multiples go to, uh, to the price. I primarily look to price to revenue for uh, personal service companies. Within my space as a CPA, the typical deal is one times gross, typically over three years as an earnout, uh, some point, some part down, and then paid out of collections to see what what uh, part of the client base sticks around. A lot of times, you want to have some transition period, so you might hang around for a year or a year and a half to get the, the clients accustomed to uh, to the new group. Um, when I pull the data. You. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. I knew you're getting a, a little ahead on the on on the answer to that kind of broad question. Um, you let me when, talk. I'm going to talk. Okay, fair enough. So the information. This is a common question I've gotten from fiduciaries. What information or documents do you require to analyze the practice? I like to get the five most recent federal tax returns. Um, and if it's uh, midpoint, then I'd like to get some internal data for the current period. Um, and this allows me to do trend analysis to see, you know, is the, if you only look at one year, you don't know, is this a good year? Or is this a bad year? Uh, you just don't know. So you try to get enough data so you can do some trend analysis. And then you start looking for things that might pop. Was there a lot of litigation in a particular year? Did revenues jump in one particular year? So maybe professional fiduciaries can also get executor fees. So maybe you had a big estate and that's not gonna carry through year after year. So trend analysis is good because it lets you sort of normalize the financial data. So you can get a pretty good sense of what, on an ongoing basis, what kind of revenue and what kind of earnings the business might generate. Got it. So um, would you want to take a look at not just the financials that the fiduciary provides you with, but um, any kind of you know contracts, um, any kind of contracts that they may have regarding their, let's call it their future or successor trustee business? Would there be something there that would help you uh, see what kind of forward potential revenues the fiduciary might be generating two, three, five years from now versus the actuals? You can. I mean, it, it gets into a more detailed discussion about discounted cash flows, looking at. Uh, I'm try to get somebody to... Go ahead. To me? Yes, go ahead, Jim. Sorry. Somebody okay, speaks. so that. What you're describing is something that you would look at um, a detailed analysis for discounted cash flow. Um, you would look at the existing um, cash flows and how they're being, what they're derived from. So I know there's various types of trusts that fiduciaries might work with. For example, you could look at a Q-tip trust and you could look to see what the life expectancy is for that second spouse. You know, tell you how many years into the future um, cash flows from that particular trust might run. So, I mean, you, you do an analysis of what's generating the revenues for the particular fiduciary, and then you sort of stratify it into different buckets. Um, and then you do do a, a timeline as to what kind of cash flows would be coming into the future for a discounted cash flow. Um, the other income approach is just straight capitalization of earnings. And if you've got a fairly stable business, that's also an accepted way to uh, calculate the value of the business. Got it. And, and I think for, you know, each fiduciary's practice is, is uh, different and some focus on certain um, types of, of uh, business.
business within their sphere. Uh, some, some I know personally have a big successor trustee practice, so that's going to be business two, three, five years from now, right? It's sort so, of it's it's sort of similar to customer backlog that other industries have. I mean, you take that into an to an account uh, that's an intangible asset. But that's, you know, the more backlog you have, the happier a uh, prospective buyer is going to be. Understood. Let me ask you, if um, uh, you were to use, I know we, you spoke about the two different types of valuation metrics. Um, when you look at a multiplier of one times, um, maybe you should explain to the, to the, to the audience um, the definition of direct capitalization versus a multiplier, you wouldn't mind. Well, a capitalization of earnings is you've got a capitalization rate that you've uh, calculated, and it tells you how many times you're going to multiply that by the seller's discretionary earnings to come up to a value. Price to revenue is simply what is the percentage times revenue that that multiple would have. Um, for this data set that I looked at, the median price to revenue multiple was 0.99 times. So that's your one times gross for uh, determining value. Got it. Now, another question. Um, if you were to do an, a, an appraisal, uh, and just for some of you, I've gotten this question many a time, the definition of an appraisal versus the definition of evaluation. In our practice, in, in our valuation or our appraisal business, to us, they're one and the same. So valuation tends to be used when you're valuing a business, a company, and appraisal is generally a hard asset, meaning real estate, uh, vehicles, um, equipment, inventory, and so on. But they're interchangeable. But Jim, how long would you say that that valuation would be good for? If one were to be, uh, if you were to be engaged to do that valuation to determine, let's call it a market value for their practice, what would you say would be that kind of time range? Well, it, you know, that's also going to depend on some external factors like where the economy is. Are you in a pandemic? Did you just hit the pandemic? Are you getting out of the pandemic? But as a general rule, um, a lot of the professionals I deal with consider six months to be the outside limit. So if you're in a normal operating environment, if you do it now, it should be good for about six months. Okay, and of course the caveat to that would be, you know, is there a big change positive or positively or negatively in that in the revenues? Right of that right. Of the business. I mean, if you, if you if you lost a major client who accounted for fifty percent of your business, and that valuation is no, not good the next day, I mean, it, it, again, you have to be in a normal, stable operating environment for it to hit that boundary. Got it. Uh, an, another question for you um, that's been posed to us: Is the valuation of a business for internal purposes? Um, different than the valuation for sale purposes? Well, sure it can be. I mean, you internally, you might have things that you're trying to do, like maybe bring on a successor trustee who might be currently an employee, um, but you eventually want to have him or her buy you out. So you might just want to get a, let's just call it a ballpark feel for what, what it could be worth. And essentially what this person might have to come up with to be ultimately be able to buy the business. Um, you know, an outside, uh, if you're selling it to an outsider, you know, again, you're going to have to take into consideration a probable earnout, out, uh, just different terms. Right. So, uh, and I think for everybody listening, that is, it is important to pay attention to that, that if you were to engage a valuation firm, us or anybody else, to value your practice, um, the, one of the first questions we, we always ask the client is, what do you intend to do with that valuation? What is the purpose? And that purpose will be, um, will help us gauge what we're doing for you, uh, but also clearly help you know what you can and can't do with that valuation. 
And that may apply to real estate or any other kind of asset that we'd be valuing for a trust or for gifting or death or whatever, whatever that is. Well, it um, defines, it helps define the scope of the project. And, you know, if the scope is smaller, obviously the price would be less. I mean, so it's, it's really important to figure out what it is being used for so you can properly set scope. Fair enough. Uh, I, I think um, when, when addressing another question regarding valuation to you, Jim, um, what, what would you say is the biggest difficulty you have when you're valuing a business uh, from, from your perspective when you're, when you're trying to, to work with that business owner uh, for their purposes of that valuation? Is there anything that comes to mind? Sure. It's always getting the, uh, the right data, getting the right data and getting the data quickly enough. I mean, projects can really uh, languish if you can't get the data. And it's understandable if the, if the business owner is really busy, preoccupied, has a major project going on, anything like that, then it's understandable that the data is not going to be forthcoming for a while. But you can't really do a proper valuation unless you get all the data that you need. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say how many times for some of you that are on this presentation, we work with many of you in our valuation practice. Um, you know what it's like trying to get data from your clients, revenues, financials, P&Ls, balance sheets. Um, you know, there's a whole host of bits of information that can be very difficult and arduous to obtain. Uh, I, I think one of the important things that Jim would, I know, would ask for is a summary of your business, right? What is it that you do? Um, can you, you know, in a one page, explain how your revenues are generated, um, you know, where they come from, the duration of them, right? Um, duration and longevity. And then um, how you manage your, your business. Uh, so, I, go ahead. so usually what, what happens in the process is I request an initial batch of data, the five years federal returns say, and I'll do some digging for like industry data and I'll look for market comps and all of that. And after I've had a chance to crunch some numbers and look at things, that's when I want to schedule a management interview so that I can hear from you directly the history of your company, the future of your company, you know, any, any pitfalls going on, labor shortages, supply issues, all of those sorts of things. And one of the things I always ask for is I need to get a sense of um, if you have any sort of customer concentrations that we need to really talk about. So the management interview, rather than just getting a, a brief summary from you, I mean, I'll look you up on the internet if I can find you, but I wanna hear from you directly to be able to discuss all the data with you. So here's a, another question um, rounding out this for you. Um, Jim, will a lender handicap evaluation more than a given buyer would for the purpose of lending a buyer the money to buy out the current owner? Um, well, I'd say, I'd say the bank, a commercial bank would probably be a lot harder than like say SBA funding. Um, you know, banks, banks like hard assets to lend on, uh, lending on cash flows for them. A lot of them aren't super keen about doing that, which is why a lot of stuff that happens in the personal service business space tends to be earn out. You're sort of financing the transaction yourself. Correct, and we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit later. Um, okay, Jim, I'm going to move over to Michael. Um, Mike, uh, you, you as a an attorney who deals in the mergers and acquisitions space of all types of companies, I know in our discussion in preparation for this uh, presentation, you know, professional services companies, of course, have a very wide degree of, of uh, revenues, income, profitability, 
And then, of course, uh, professional services companies themselves uh, take on a, a wide degree of, of, of definition. So, you know, a fiduciary's practice may be similar to a CPA's practice, but different than a, law, a, a lawyer's practice. So you being the expert attorney that would help a fiduciary um, through this transaction, and maybe I should say not just the fiduciary that wants to sell, but also potentially the fiduciary that's the acquirer or the merging, the merging group, right? Um, from that perspective, um, would you say a, an attorney is needed in this kind of transaction to start? Well, I'm slightly conflicted, and it's a somewhat subjective view, but I think most people objectively would say absolutely yes, uh, because there are just a number of different things you go through in a definitive purchase agreement that you really want to prepare for. There's stages in the process that you want to get well prepared for uh, that I'll go into uh, a little further uh, as we go along. Uh, but a, lawyer, a, a seasoned business lawyer that has expertise in M&A is absolutely, you know, uh, won't say essential, but it, it really improves the odds of a good outcome. And, and, and you're sort of, you know, fighting with one arm tied behind your back if you don't have one. Um, I'll also just put in a quick plug for a couple of other professional service provider types um, in this context. On most deals I work with, pretty much everybody has a CPA who does their tax returns for them. Um, and we really want to engage with them if they have, you know, the expertise to advise uh, a client on, you know, the, the tax ramifications of, of various transaction structures. We have our own tax attorneys, you know, in-house that I work with as well. They're not filing the returns though. So we always want to make sure we're on the same page with them um, and that they're giving you guidance. They also uh, tend to have a slightly lower hourly billing rate. So the, to the degree uh, it, it's a smaller transaction uh, and the CPA can take on a lot of the tax analysis for the client. That's, you know, a benefit as well. But we always want to make sure uh, that we're aligned uh, with each other we end up doing a lot more of the work in the overall deal, but after tax proceeds is what everybody should care about the most. Um, you know, you know, top line advertised purchase price is important, but knowing what you're going to get at the end of the day after your structure uh, is, is really important. Um, and then just quickly also, uh, not every time there are many, there are many businesses that sell without the use of an investment banker or a business broker, but just like if you're selling a piece of real estate or another asset and you want to hire someone like Vaughn Premier to do that sort of thing for you, there are folks that specialize uh, in, you know, selling investment bankers, business brokers who create that kind of competitive tension of an auction process that both allows you to evaluate multiple buyers, potential buyers in terms of the price that they're willing to propose, uh, but then also uh, the structure that they're willing to give and the more sort of competition you can create for your asset, the better a price, presumably, and also the better terms that you can generate. They also help keep the buyer honest. Um, we lawyers will communicate typically with the lawyers on the other side. And sometimes if there's not an investment banker, we'll be uh, communicating directly with the business people. But if you're in the, the selling position, you're probably extremely sophisticated in how you run your business and, and make it successful, but you haven't gone through an M&A event yet. Um, if you're partnering with someone, it can be hard to be the sort of bad guy, you know, pushing for better terms, but that's the investment banker or business broker's job. So I, I find that the best results, um, you know, come from deals that have, you know, rep, you know each of the three uh, professional service categories filled. Um, and anyway, that was a longer answer than you probably wanted. But <laughs> that's Okay, I well, fair enough. I, I appreciate that, that basic introduction. So moving on to the next step for you. What is your process when you get involved in the sale of a, a professional services company? When, when I say process, what would you, you know, what would you want to see from your client? Um, timing, um, you know, kind of get into some of the, you know, the, the, the 50,000 foot mechanics of it. Sure. Well, to begin with, the ideal is, from our perspective, to uh, have a client who's willing to engage with their counsel and 
sort of conduct internal diligence. Um, you know, I, we kind of call it you know, prophylactic diligence that sort of allows you to identify if you have any soft spots. Because the buyer, if they're going to be paying value for your business, they're going to scrutinize your legal and business setup. They're going to want to see your contracts, particularly those that generate recurring revenues. They'll probably be less concerned about ones that, you know, generate one-time episodic revenue that's not going to be recurring in the future under their, you know, uh, you know post the, the transaction. But they'll definitely be concerned about the contracts that you have, particularly with significant, you know, revenue sources, and that, you know, they're, you know, strong. You don't have, you know, too much exposure liability on it, um, that, you know, you wouldn't believe, I mean, these are, you guys are all fiduciaries, so you're probably very responsible in your record keeping practices. A lot of the small businesses we sell are not as disciplined about it. So there's a lot of cleanup that we do in advance. You want to get that all done before you're, uh, quote unquote, opening the kimono to a buyer uh, for diligence purposes. So we ideally have that. We, we put together something called a diligence request list that um, is usually sort of a softer, shorter version of what the buyer is ultimately going to present to you. But again, that's all with the purpose of sort of allowing us to help ferret out any issues that there might be that you want to get cleaned up um, before you start providing uh, buyer the diligence. That said, and, and we prefer to do that pre-LOI, pre you talking with buyers, um, but there are many clients who don't really want to spend a lot of money on lawyers and legal fees until they know they're you know, closer to having a deal you know, on the table uh, and then being willing to invest the, the money. So we, we have those situations too, where basically we're kind of coming up to a letter of intent or just past a letter of intent uh, into an exclusivity period. Um, makes it a little, the job a little tougher, makes it a little bit riskier in terms of what a buyer might find if we haven't had a chance to scrub things with the client in advance. Um, but we see those situations too. Um, and if you want me to get into the sort of process, you know, with the particular buyers, we can kind of get into that. So what we would typically see is that a buyer uh, will want to lock you up into exclusivity. And, and by the way, for, the, for those who are you know, on the buy side or interested in making acquisitions, I'm happy to speak with you about you know, the kind of strategy on the acquisition side. But my understanding is most of these, most of the folks in this call are probably going to be uh, looking to sell their practices. So a buyer is going to want to lock you into exclusivity before it expends significant resources uh, both time and money, um, you know, evaluating your business. They want to know that you're not concurrently shopping it, you know, once they're starting to make that investment to multiple parties. So what you'll typically see is a non-binding letter of intent or term sheet that um, basically sets out in three, four, five, six pages the full terms of the deal, carries a 45 to 60 day. Sometimes the buyers will ask for 90 days or more exclusivity period. You generally don't want it to be too long because if you decide that you know this isn't the right buyer for you, you know you want to be able to move along to another one um, if it's not working out with that particular buyer. Um, we try to do as much of the um, you know negotiation of critical business terms in that LOI because we find the time that the seller has the most negotiating leverage against the buyer is before the seller has gone exclusive. You can imagine, right? Like it, it's it's. If, if, if a buyer knows they have to make concessions in order to lock you up into exclusivity, they're going to be more inclined to do so than after they've put you into exclusivity. Um, and then, you know, from, from the time that the LOI is signed, that's when the buyer really starts to conduct its diligence, both, you know, legal, it's probably done a little bit of business diligence in advance just to sort of see that it's, you know, interested. Um, and then going all the way back, you'll want to have a non-disclosure agreement, obviously, with anybody that you're disclosing your financial or other sensitive confidential information to. So that would be the very first thing to get an NDA. So let me, Michael, let me ask you a question, just to interrupt. Sure. On the NDA, uh, non-disclosure agreement and confidentiality agreement, how long, how long uh, are those valid for? There, it varies. Um, I'll tell you that the sort of industry standard is like two years. Um, and buyers will often negotiate it down to 18 months. They'll seek to negotiate it down to a year, but they'll they'll never decline to do 18 months. They don't want two years typically. You can try for a longer period, but you know typically it, it, we go out with two years when we have you know investment bankers running processes and they're going out to 50 different buyers. The default starting point is is two years. Um, one other important thing, you know, buyers will often 
ask you to uh, do a mutual non-disclosure agreement, which I don't think is appropriate in commercial settings. Mutual non-disclosure agreements are perfectly reasonable because each party's you know, probably disclosing information to each other. But when you're the target in a potential M&A setting, it's really you disclosing the lion's share of, in, in, of information. Um, if it's going to be a merger and they're going to have to give you a lot of information about their the buyer's organization, and uh, then a bilateral can be more fair and reasonable. Um, so it depends on the context, but yeah, two right. years of, of protection typically. Two years, okay, thank you. Um, so m moving into like documentation, um, when you're gonna draft an agreement, now, you know, I think one thing I'd like to just say to you and everybody else from our experience is that this may be kind of a mutual agreement, right? You're not necessarily working for one party, uh, the buyer or the seller, you might actually be working for both. So putting yourself in that kind of position, what, what kind of um, documents when you're drafting a, a purchase and sale agreement would you wanna see? What, what would you need? So quickly, just uh, first, uh, we, as lawyers, we can only represent either the buyer or seller, never both at the same time. I you know, understand that that is prevalent in some industries, you know, real estate broker. An investment banker, you know, often becomes <clears throat> a little conflicted along the process because they only get paid if the deal closes. And so they'll, you know, sort of, they're not playing, but they, they, you, the seller, are their client typically, but they will do a lot of, you know, kind of they'll they'll try to you know make you make your stances more reasonable and they'll also try to you know work against the buyer so as i mentioned in the loi stage when you have the most leverage we try to structure it first as a stock deal uh, there's multiple reasons for that um tends to have a better tax outcome um results in the sort of business staying intact and means that you have less um contract assignments to worry about uh, if you sell the assets of your business, you're literally selling the contracts and assigning it to a new party. Many contracts have anti-assignment provisions. If only the ownership of your legal entity is changing, it's a change of ownership, not an assignment, um, then you don't have, typically you don't have to go to all these third parties and ask for consent to assign the contract. So that's some of the, the, the principal stuff that we try to negotiate up front. We also try to um, minimize cap your potential indemnity exposure in a purchase agreement, which I told you like an LOI is, you know, between four, six, seven pages, a purchase agreement is typically 40 to 60. It has a lot of boilerplate, um, but uh, one thing it ha will have is a, is a reasonable number of representations and warranties about your business um, so that a buyer basically wants to know that it's buying a business that it's, that, that it wants to know about the contracts, wants to know you're in compliance with laws. It wants to know, that you're, uh, you're not violating others' intellectual property, things like that. So we, ultimately those reps and warranties can be negotiated a bit, but they're somewhat standardized and you, know, you take on some risk. But we try to do, say you sell your business for 10 million, we try to get you an indemnity cap of 10% or 15% or 7.5% even. The bigger the deal, the easier it is to get a lower percentage. And that makes you sleep better at night because that means there's less for the buyer to come back at you for if there ends up being you know, a problem with your reps and warranties. So that's one of the critical things from the sell side that I always want to get um, in addition to the stock purchase structure. Those are the, and, and if you negotiate them at the LOI stage, the purchase agreement negotiation becomes a lot smoother because everybody knows what the most high level, important fundamental uh, risk exposure and, you know, tax result uh, situation is going to be. Um, and then, yeah, in that 40 to 50 pages, there's a number of different things that we try to make more favorable to the seller. Usually the buyer gets to do the first cut of the purchase agreement. So the seller's in reactive positioning. Um, and that's again, why we try to you know, outline as much of it as we can in the LOI. So let me ask you uh, first, uh, just to, for a terminology standpoint for everybody, LOI stands for letter of intent. Uh, those of you who may have sold um, a a commercial property with us, uh, sometimes an offer may come in as a letter of intent and not on a purchase agreement. Um, you know, in, in using an LOI versus a, a standard contract in the case of a business transaction like this is much more standard because it, as Mike said, it outlines the basic terms. 
nobody's going to want to go spend a lot of money with with legal before general terms are hashed out. Um, so that goes back to what Jim said before, when you're using evaluation to at least understand the, the potential value of your business, you're going to look at that in advance of uh, of spending a lot of money um, agreeing with a buyer on a on a term of a purchase contract. You're going to go to an LOI or letter of intent and try to negotiate all of those terms in general, and and make the process. I think a far as Mike said, far more cost effective. Uh, but for, Mike, would you agree more fluid? It, it, yeah, no, absolutely. It I mean, less less chance of breakage. You know, like if, if the if the buyer and seller are fundamentally aligned on the most important business terms up front in the LOI, I wouldn't characterize it exactly as paint by numbers. That would diminish too much what we lawyers do, but it just makes it the process a heck of a lot easier, uh, smoother, less time intensive. Um, and so, yeah, that's why we strongly recommend having a, a smartly, you know, negotiated LOI up front. So another question for you, kind of moving along quickly, because I know we have limited time. You know, what would be a couple of things you want to um, point out to our to our viewers today uh, regarding protecting themselves, uh, you know, after the completion of the sale of the business? Yeah. So, well... Look, I mean, there's a, there's a there's a few different things. I mean, you, you want to have all your information and documents, you know, prepared. You know, you want to have conducted the internal diligence process. You identify any you know warts or issues with your contracts or other aspects of your business, so you can try to get them cleaned up before you actually transact. There's relatively little you can do post closing um, to fix things from the past. Um, so again, it's it's you know negotiating. You know the reps and warranties to be as tight and limited as possible. Um, sometimes there's limited flexibility to do that. So you try to get in down the gap, right? Like even if I've got problems with my business on a five million dollar sale, I've only got five hundred thousand or seven hundred fifty thousand potential liability uh, outside of fraud and maybe you know one or two other things. Um, th that really gives you the best kind of sleep at night protection. Um, another thing, if it's, you know, it's just <laughs> helping the business to operate well post-closing because buyers of businesses that are doing poorly or, you know, not as well as expected post-closing versus their expectations prior to closing are more likely to bring claims against the seller to recoup part of their purchase price than they are, you know, on a business that's, you know, flourishing, you know, post-closing. Uh, it's probably relatively intuitive, but um, yeah, just, you know, Make sure your house is in order. Hire a lawyer that helps you, you know, structure protections for you, preferably not as an asset deal, because in asset sales, usually the seller is left holding the bag on all liabilities that arose from prior to closing. Whereas on a stock deal, um, you, you know, the, the seller is, you know, the, the liabilities stay with the business and your only indemnity obligations are for reps and warranties that were quote unquote wrong. Fair enough. Um... I just got a quick question that came in. Uh, so I want to address this uh, real quick before we move on to the next big topic here for you, Mike. Um, Jim, couldn't a business valuation still intertwine with the new practice administrator provisions coming down the pipeline? So that question is um, maybe a little specific for, for you. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask it again. Couldn't a business valuation still intertwine with the new practice, uh, let's call it the buyer, uh, their business coming down the pipeline? Would that valuation have uh, credibility merit for them to rely on? Let's just ask it that way. Uh, I'm not sure that I entirely understand the question. You're basically looking to like value the pipeline, the, uh, the customer backlog per se? Uh, well, you know, interesting, that's not the direct question, but I would say that would be a, a good, yeah, you could answer that. In valuing the business, you're going to value the pipeline that might be two or three or four years down the road based upon successor trustee business that the fiduciary has, has booked in their quote unquote business, right? 
So you could extrapolate out, right? If you knew that potentially in two or three years, this business was going to generate another $800,000 in, in revenues, and you had, you know, you had that framework, you could extrapolate out a value two or three years down the road, right? Not just today. You know, I mean, that would again be in a discounted cash flow model. Um, but, you know, the customer backlog also could kind of be viewed as like, you know, just to ensure to the buyer that if you're going to have some accounts start to drop off because they either hit their, their termination date or whatever, that the level of gross revenues will continue. Um, one, one point I'd like to bring in as I was listening to, uh, uh, to Michael is um, in the diligence phase, there's also diligence that you need to do on the potential buyer. And that's because you want to make sure that the buyer's got the ability to perform, that they have the ability to pay you. If you have a buyer coming along, you need to know that their reputation is such that they'll maintain the practice that you've currently got so that there's not a lot of, you know, drop off. Um, so you do need to do some things like that. I mean, if they're brand new out of school or something, I don't know that I'd sell them to them, but, you know, if you've got um, an existing fiduciary who wants to buy your practice, you certainly want to check out their reputation and just, you need to be able to know that they're going to perform. Understood. Agreed. Mike, moving back to you, um, you know, in the situations that we've been involved with fiduciaries and, and what I've always said to them is that the fairest way in negotiating a transaction is generally an earn out. And that earn out um, makes it comfortable for the fiduciary. You know, and, and, and I've said this to some of you who I've had conversations with um, you know, you're merging businesses. You look at law firms. Uh, I think Mike could speak to this. Law firms don't buy and sell each other. They merge. It's goodwill. It's goodwill. And that goodwill can walk out the door every single day and move to another firm, similar to a CPA firm. So in the fiduciary world, um, you know, you're, you're, it's a merger. It's a, a merger of expertise and of business. There may very well be some upfront cash uh, uh, from that potential studer, but the earnout becomes very fair um, for both parties because the selling party and the buying party both know and are going to see based upon what revenues come down the line. Uh, so Mike, speak to earnouts and how you see them being valuable in this practice. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'll start. I'll first start from the principle of, you know, guaranteed cash best, you know, <clears throat> uh, debt from the buyer, you know, not as good as cash, but locked in and you're entitled to it, assuming they're solvent. And less attractive is an earnout, but, you know, in professional services business, I fully acknowledge that that is frequently, you know, the setup because it is an assets walk on two feet, you know, type business. And, um, and, and that, and it does help to some degree with alignment. Um, earnouts can be problematic because you don't control necessarily when you merge, depending on the type of merger that it is, you don't control the business in the same way that you do uh, when you're operating it on your own. So going to Jim's point of the character of the buyer, the trustworthiness and reputation of the buyer, is this someone that you can trust to help you operate your business, you know, within the new organization in a manner that will allow you to maximize the earnout dollars um, that are contracted for? Um, unfortunately, uh, in M&A, there is some gamesmanship, you know, by buyers, like you know, like you know, they will. You know, if it's a if it's a bottom line based earnout, they might manipulate expenses over onto your P and L to reduce your your profitability. So it's preferred to have a top line based earnout, which is less manipulable man, manipulable by a buyer. Um, I'm a glasses half full optimist generally, but I have to be a little bit of a skeptic when I'm representing sellers. So I I warn them: be careful. There there are a lot more disputes and deals that have earnouts than in those that don't. 
simply because, you know, again, a lot of times buyers don't want to pay up. They figure out ways post-closing to, you know, reduce. So you just have to be careful. The other important part is the tax structure. You know, the earnout, if it's done in a way where it is a true purchase and you can qualify for capital gains, you're looking at anywhere between a 14 to 18%, you know, better yield on your after-tax proceeds. If you're an S Corp, it's 18%. You know, if it's another structure, it might be 14%, just depending on if the Obamacare tax applies. But it's very meaningful. And then again, that's why you need to have counsel and or a savvy tax CPA helping you through and, and, and making you understand, you know, how the earnout will be treated, how your deal structure will be treated. Yeah, I think that's, uh, it's, it's very well said. I think from, I mean, from my vantage point, talking to the fiduciaries that we've been involved with and trying to help them in, let's call our merger of business or a sale of business, um, uh, a conversation I'll never forget. I had, oh, it's probably seven or eight or that's eh, probably eight or nine years ago uh, when a fiduciary came to us about um, valuing and potentially selling their practice and should they hire a business broker. And I said to, to them at the time, I said, there's no business broker that's going to really understand this business. This is so specialized. It is absolutely, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, if you look at the planets and Pluto being the furthest planet, uh, this is a business on Pluto, right? Mm -hmm. It is so specialized that a business broker would look at it and they'd say, who, who would even be a buyer? They wouldn't even be able to figure it out. And in that case, in that situation, I said very simply, I said, I'm using common sense here. Your best, your best buyer is either going to be some trust related company that's trying to gain assets or another fiduciary that wants to grow their practice geographically in another area or with more um, specialty within the fiduciary business they're working on. And that's going to be your best approach. Now, the difficulty for in that case was, and the question I'll never forget was, well, Todd, uh, how do I get um, you know, how do I get control? Uh, how do I, how do I, well, oh, how do I find out who's interested? Right? Because I don't want everybody knowing that my, pra you know, that I'm retiring or my practice is for sale or something to that effect. They, they didn't want that information out there. So I, I said, it really has to be a very, very focused um, thought process. And quite frankly, the fiduciary themselves may be the best person uh, to engage and start that conversation, right? Um, they're not going to necessarily need or even want a business broker because the business broker is not going to understand what the heck they do. So, um, you know, when, when you're all thinking about how to start this process, you have to think about your targets and who potentially would see the value in you, your value in merging with them and or vice versa. Because in a transaction of a sale, let's say you're a fiduciary that happens to have a number of, uh, of newer fiduciaries within your practice, and even though you guys are all kind of separate and sole businesses on your own, um, the people within your organization may be your best suitor or best long-term partner, as I like to say. Uh, and what Jim and Mike can do in these cases is help structure the, um, the, the strategy of a transaction that is going to benefit you and benefit them, uh, but also create those protections. Uh, because Mike, as you know, the, one of the most common things I say to fiduciaries, whatever we're doing for them is how do we best protect you? What is it we're going to do for you in our services and our business and how do we protect you from parties involved? Um, so when I, when I, when, you know, when I hear about what you're mentioning and knowing what most of these fiduciaries are focused about is how do they protect themselves? Right. And not necessarily just from the, the person they're 
is buying the business or merging with or earning it out, whatever you want to call it, um, but possibly also their clients. Is there any recommendation you might have, Mike, that would help them understand are there protections um, when they sign a client up, knowing that they may sell their business ten year, five years from now, that they may want to have in their agreement, right? You follow me? That allows them to uh, to convey their practice. What? what, 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 what Sorry. Go ahead. I have a little feedback there. But uh, yes, I mean, that is one of the, in contract, generally, if you can avoid having an anti-assignment provision, or at least if the anti-assignment provision has a carve out that does not require the counter, the client or other uh, contract counterparty consent to a, an assignment in the case of a sale of all or substantially all of the assets of your business, which typically people are willing to grant, you know, that would, that would be great, you know, um, and then, you know, if, if, you know, the counterparty refuses that says no, in any assignment, I need, if you, if you assign this contract to a third party, I need to have a consent, right? At minimum, you don't want to have uh, a change of ownership of your legal entity to be deemed to be an assignment. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, if you do a stock sale, you sell the stock, or equity if you're an LLC of your business to a third party, that is not an assignment of the contract. That is merely a change of ownership. Some contracts like leases, like commercial banking arrangements and the like will always capture a change of control and treat it as an assignment. Most other commercial contracts won't. So that's one of the things I'd counsel you to do. You know, try to, you know, if you have to agree to an anti-assignment provision, Try to get an exemption for a sale of all or substantially all the assets of your business and, 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 and never agree to a change of ownership clause if you can avoid it. Uh, fair enough. Thank you. You know, I'm watching the chat feed and I've been trying to interject some of these comments in the chat feed that some of you have been putting in uh, and answering yourselves, which has been really uh, terrific. Um, if, if you're all watching the chat feed, um, I think one of the the common, common issues that, that I've had just in general discussions with Mike and Jim with fiduciaries is, um, you know, naming that successor uh, or, you know, that successor trustee that, you know, their fiduciary themselves as an individual, even though they may be part of a S corp or some sort of protective entity, but in the end, they're named individually. And as such, you know, they have certain um, liabilities and they're very, you know, every fiduciary is always concerned about that liability. Is there, a, is there anything you'd want to address in, 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 in closing on your end that might address that question to them? How do they limit that uh, liability um, for them in that, let's say, succession process that they're going to name that next party? Uh, that would take over their business. Anything that you want to add? So I, I mean, again, I'm I'm not as familiar with the fiduciary world necessarily as as you and Jim are. I'm a trust and estates people probably, but in our conversation, you know, Todd, I, I know you suggested that you could uh, name another successor trustee that is within your organization, right? So that the you know, the organization, the S Corp, LLC, C Corp, whatever it may be, you know, still retains that revenue upside as long as that colleague is reputable, I guess, typically younger with a, you know, uh, longer career runway or whatever than you might have personally. Um, that is a, you know, good route to protecting the value in your business enterprise um, to the extent you can, you know, designate and it's acceptable to, you know, whomever has approval over that successor trustee. Fair enough. Jim, I'm going to ask uh, one last question to you. Um, how long would you say it takes to value a, in general, I mean, I, I mean, we're speaking about this practice here, but how long does it take you to value a business once you're engaged? What would you, how would you, just an estimate in time? Well, <clears throat> in a perfect world, if you got all of the data up front and all of the data, you know, that you, any further data requests, you can do it typically within 10 days, but I would also say typically you never get everything that quickly. 
Correct. So, you know, it's it really just depends on the, the data flow. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to ask um, Michael, uh, unless he, I know he had to chime out just for the, at, at our time frame. Um, so Michael, if you're there, um, I'm here. how long would it take you in your, on your side to draft a, a contract once kind of the LOI, the terms in the LOI have been more or less agreed on? Yeah, so I mean, once the LOI is completed, and I, you know, I mentioned earlier the exclusivity period of 45 to 60 days, it probably typically shakes out at 60. Um, you know, around that amount of time, the actual drafting of the initial cut of the purchase agreement, whether it comes from seller or buyer, probably about 10 days or so to customize, you know, the forms and templates we have to the particular deal and circumstances that we're facing. Um, and then there's a kind of back and forth negotiation that occurs over time. There's the purchase agreement. There's your employment agreement. There may well be a non-compete agreement. So there's a few ancillary documents. If you're merging practices, you're going to want to study the stockholder agreement or limited liability company agreement of the company that you're going to be owning an equity interest of as part of the, the merged firm. So you know, there, there's a lot of details. The reps and warranties come with disclosure schedules where you, you know, disclose information that is responsive to the reps and warranties. So there's a little bit of factual investigation there. So I'd say it's fair to say <clears throat> about 45, 60 days, sometimes 90. I've had deals that get complicated that require third-party financing. They can go 120 or more days, um, you know, so, but it, it varies, but in an optimal situation, you get a clean LOI negotiated from the time that the LOI is signed by both parties. You know, 60 days is a reasonable period of time to expect between then and the actual closing and funding of the transaction. Fair enough. Um, okay, so uh, I want to say in closing, for all of you that have participated, and thank you. Um, first off, uh, Michael, would you just tell everybody what's your email address? And we'll post it for everybody, but. Sure. Uh, first initial, last name at the initials of my law firm, which is mstoik at jmbm.com. And Mike is based uh, in. Uh, the Southern California market, but as I said, his firm is throughout the uh, throughout California, and um, you know, for everybody here uh, that follows our fiduciary education forum next month, um, because it is um, uh, towards the end of May, and the the PFAC conference in San Francisco is. Um, um, it, towards the end of May, uh, where where we are going to be dark in May, we will pick up in June. We are going to have a great topic and speakers in, from the trust uh, from the trust world, um, and relating directly to the fiduciary business practice and the growth of their uh, the growth of the fiduciary practice um, uh, through through trust companies, uh, and so that'll be in June uh, at some point. Um, I, our company uh, is, I'm speaking on a panel at the fiduciary conference uh, uh, in San Francisco on a very interesting topic regarding partition referee, partition sales of real estate and how they're handled, how they're used. And uh, we've got a great panel. Uh, so for those of you who are going to the conference, we hope to see you there. For those of you who are not, maybe you're attending via, um, via Zoom. And otherwise, I, I want to thank everybody. Um, this is probably the most number of chats we've had in any of our uh, fiduciary presentations uh, for the past over a year now. So um, we will send this link out to all of you. Uh, this was recorded. So anybody who wants to listen to it again, uh, we'll send it out and uh, hope it's helpful. And I want to thank everybody for participating. And any questions that I can answer or uh, my associate Jim as well can answer, we're, we're here to assist in any way. And I wanna thank uh, Jim and Mike for participating and preparing for this and hope you all found this was uh, very helpful and beneficial for you. And again, on a one-by-one -one basis, I'm here to just help uh, any of you just talk things through, answer some very basic business questions and 
and uh, help you understand what I've learned from my conversations with uh, and learning about the fiduciary uh, issues that are all pending for all of you, which is what do we do and how do we exit this business in some form? So I'm happy to help if I can. So everyone, thank you very much. I know we're a little bit over the after the hour. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. And I hope to see you uh, in June, if not at the PFAC conference. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Michael. And we're going to sign off. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Have a good week.